we're gonna uh what we will do gentlemen is we will wait for a few minutes to make sure probably at around one of in in four or five minutes is when we'll start so a few minutes after the fact all right well then we can keep we can keep saying bad words what you're saying well, yes no, there's people in here there is people in here now so oh, well, then i we won't can, i will uh, reserve the vulgarities for later Smart. we can we can educate and entertain all right i'm good at that and, and the chat's open yeah do. usually we know uh a few of these folks let's look at the attendees i know glenn i think i know richard we got two wilsons in here and we got a wilson on the panel we got a, or we got a will sorry not wilson it's close enough though that Wilson, there's will, two Wilson, will three Wilsons. Oh, there are two Wilsons, but two of them have the same name. Oh, that's the Wilson. Wilson Henry. Where'd he go? Oh, he just left. He left to so prove a point. Jeff Reed was a kicker for the Steelers in the early 2000s. That was more known for getting into a fight with a paper towel dispenser than his accomplishments on the field. At least that's how I remember Jeff Reed. Got it. May or may not be the same. Now we can. I don't see there any paper towel dispensers. <laughs> awesome. For those of you who just joined, we'll get started in just a few minutes. We'll let some folks trickle in. Uh, and we love commentary, questions, and in the chat. So if you have any questions, even if it's about why are both Will and Reed wearing hats, what's the deal with that? Although that we is get a cold hat. heads. That rhymed. <laughs> cold heads, man. We get cold heads. Um, I used to uh sarcastic comments are always welcome as well. Yeah, well. There's usually a few people in here that'll end up uh end up heckling from the rafters, but I don't see any of the usual suspects for now. But uh oh, you sure. are correct, Reed. I am traveling. I actually will be spending something like 30 weeks of this year on the road. Man. That's a that's a tough go, but also exciting because I know why because you guys are doing some pretty amazing stuff. So like, congrats! Thank you. I made a statement to Josh the other day, which is this is exactly what we needed. I will not be doing this next year. <laughs> it's like I will not be traveling this much. So I've probably seen a lot of a lot of you you folks in the in the crowd. I've probably seen you at conferences because I've been to most of them this year. Yeah. Uh, Jeff asked where you can get a hat. And Jeff, if you come to, uh, if you are going to be at IT Nation, we will have hats there. If you won't be, hit us up and we'll get you a hat. Well, of course, you if you don't mean one of these hats and you just mean a generic hat, you can probably find one online or at Target. Um, there's a store called Lids that specializes in hats. And if you go to a fancy Stop. men's clothing store, you can get like those gangster, like old 1920 gangster hats. Those are pretty yeah. cool too. We will get started in a few minutes, folks. Although this is some wonderful, uh, maybe if you have a trivia night in your wherever you live, this is some <laughs> interesting trivia you can take. Funny part on lids is uh, I went to Hawaii with my wife's family, and it's the first time my father-in-law had ever seen a lids store, and he just starts freaking out. He's like, "There's a whole store just dedicated to hats. Like we don't have this at home." It's like, "Uh, Jim, there's literally one in the mall, twenty minutes from our house. Like, there, I promise you, I've been there." And he goes. Oh, I've never seen it. This is like a multinational chain. There are thousands yeah. of lid stores. Thousands of lid stores. A uh, hat store. I'll be. What do they think of next? What do they think of next? I don't know. Two stores? <laughs> Two stores. Uh, Juicero. And uh, we saw how that went. So, <laughs> Folks, for those of you just joining. Uh, and it, hey, Kurt, if you want to be a problem MSP, that's... Uh, Unfortunately or fortunately, that's our specialty. So feel free to ask the hard questions and we'll give you the probably disappointing answers, but we'll do it. But we'll do it for sure. We'll try our best. We'll get started here in a few seconds. Um, for those of you who this is the first webinar of uh, DCD, Deep Cyber Dive, that you've joined this month, it's a webinar series aimed at just helping MSPs, educating them on selling cybersecurity. This one is about cyber insurance. I, I wanted to call it the joys of cyber insurance, right? Every time I talk with you two, it, I just get a good, a warm feeling. You know, you're just friendly people, uh, but. We are the joys of cyber insurance. It's it's not that innate, like you don't feel joy when you hear the word insurance. So I'm glad that we as yes. individuals could bring the joy 
to you calling yeah. around insurance. Yeah. Bye. The joys of insurance. Well, I appreciate that. And Glenn, Glenn from the rafters, joy and insurance do not belong in the same sentence, unless your insurance agent is named joy, in which case joy, right. Joy. Um, for those of you who don't know, we have one more webinar focused on is how is cybersecurity different from managed IT? That's coming up October 24th at 3 PM with buddies of mine, Kyle Christensen and the wonderful Wes Spencer. But today, what we have lined up for you is an insur cyber insurance masterclass. I'll call it that. And we have on the call today, Reed. Reed, I could introduce you. I would probably say a slew of things which are not accurate oh. uh, and maybe disheartening to some. So, Reed, introduce yourself. Who are you? <laughs> um, well, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do best to not do that to myself. So, uh, everyone, my name is Reed. Um, I'm the president of Fifth Wall Solutions. We are a cyber focused and cyber only insurance wholesaler uh, meaning we're work right into the carriers and we work with about almost 50 carriers so um, after doing this for about eight years across agents agencies uh, and now in the msp space um we uh we know a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two just to grab a insurance jingle um i'm an insurance nerd i have four kids my life is very busy uh but i love everything that i do so we'll keep it at that awesome uh, Reed is also a hugger. If you see him at a conference, he would probably love a hug from you. He especially, he especially really likes do. when you cup his elbow during the hug. That's so weird. Why <laughs> would you go there? <laughs> I love it. I love it already. And then we have the wonderful Will Brooks, Pastor Will Brooks, as I call him, Reverend Will, Reverend Brooks, whatever you want to call him. Will, introduce yourself. Who are you other than a friend of mine? Also, just call me Will, whatever you want to do. Um, no titles needed, but Thanks, Connor. Super pumped to be here. I am uh, at, at Fifth Wall. I'm the solutions engineer. My whole focus is around helping MSPs specifically learn how learn about our program and how we partner alongside MSPs, um, and ultimately what we do to uh, I don't want to say add insurance into their stack, but help them incorporate insurance into the overall cybersecurity strategy of clients. Um, family wise, I'm married, but I only I have no kids yet, but one is on the way. So that's exciting. Um, and that's about it right now. Awesome. Uh, before we dive into the first topic, a couple of notes. Uh, cyber insurance. So, Finn, we work with exclusively MSPs. So I've met not only a lot of you here listening, but I've met hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of MSPs over the last few years. Cyber insurance, especially today, continues to be a subject that not, not only brings... Uh, usually a bit of pain to somebody's life as an MSP, but also confusion. You don't know where to start. It's this black box of information uh, and essentially a ton of risk that you, uh, I'm guessing you're here because you want to educate yourself on that. So that I thought it really prudent to bring two experts, Will and Reed here, um, into kind of educate y'all on where should you begin in cyber insurance? What is cyber insurance doing today? Where is it going? How many years behind is the cyber insurance industry from the, from the real threats that you'll end up facing as an MSP? Or rather, um, a, a place that I see a lot of questions on is, what is the MSP's place in cyber insurance, right? You're not an agent. You're not a broker. You can't represent a cyber insurance agency because, well, you're not licensed to do so. But your clients expect you to answer and know, and just know things randomly about all of it. So it's just an incredibly confusing place to be. And Will and, and Reed, whenever I've watched them talk on it, they've helped me understand, which has helped me understand I shouldn't be talking about it. I should just point everyone over to these two guys to say, hey, what's going on? So our first question. Oh, by the way, ask questions. If you're in the if you're in the audience and you got a question and it's relevant to you or your business, that is where you will get the most value. Chances are if you're thinking about asking a question, a lot of other people in the audience are as well. And everyone, including us, would would get the great benefit of being able to talk through that and answer it for you. So Reed, how do we get here? And here is the current state of cyber insurance. What's the history up until now and, and where are yeah. we today? So why, why are two insurance guys on a webinar in front of MSPs? Let's, let's, yes. let's back, let's, let's walk backwards a little bit. Yeah, so um, for MSPs listening, I'm assuming there's kind of like a, two categories of thought before we can go through the history. You're thinking of you yourself, your business, right? You have your own insurance and that's probably come with some history there. Uh, good, bad, ugly, some pain. And then you also have your clients where you have the role of filling out applications, probably answer a lot of questions, but you're involved in that process, whether you want to be or not. And that's just been the evolution. So 
Uh, let's quickly backtrack through some of the relevant pieces that have affected those two. Um, cyber insurance for a while, since like 2014, 15, um, was very, very basic and very, very new, especially from the insurance carrier's perspective of understanding like how much of a need is this? What is it really going to do? Ultimately, we haven't seen it in action. So carriers from like 2015 to 2019 are out there slinging policies, right? They put products together. And, and just so far everyone knows, like Will and I do not represent a carrier. So when I say wholesaler, we actually work with them all. So I'm happy to point out all the fallacies and basically everything that went wrong um, because you know we're, our role is more of an education standpoint than anything. So we have carriers that are not doing two things. They're running policies and they're not looking at what it is that they are underwriting. So back then they were not asking questions around relevant security controls. And if they were, they weren't really incorporated into the actual underwriting, right? So maybe they were getting some data. They were maybe asking about security awareness training, but were they actually underwriting off of it? They were not, right? Um, and then the second is they did not really know how to price it. They were not pricing accordingly. So they wanted to get market share and they did just that. As you would imagine, that had a negative repercussion whenever ransomware came into the scene, BEC came into the scene, all these things that uh, became rampant really fast. And then uh, you know what hit the fan. Um, carriers started losing money rapidly. Um, we saw carriers pull out. We saw them start to raise their rates um, in a ridiculous way. Um, but one thing that did start to happen is they quickly realized they were not asking the right questions. They needed to change that. So they changed their tune and they changed their applications to be asking specific things, right? Do you have MFO in place? Do you have EDR in place? Do you have segregated backups? They're getting more specific and understanding the security aspect because they want to better understand the risks. So you fast forward to today, right? And I'm assuming a lot of the pain that was felt was, hey, my rate went up like crazy. And uh, hey, this got a lot more complicated, either for yourself or in your interaction with your clients, right? Um, well, they're still learning from those past mistakes, but it's slowly but surely getting a little bit more stable. We are seeing it and we'll see it even more so out in the field where we're seeing rates are starting to get leveled off for the most part. Um, and the practice, right, the process behind the seat of what insurance is doing to get the information, we're now seeing common trends in, as far as like, generally speaking, what are insurance looking for? Like how tall do you have to be to get on the ride? to be eligible for cyber insurance. That's all, you know, there was a lot of frustration, but the good news is that's kind of like, we, we learn lessons the hard way, if that makes sense. So for MSPs, right, Fifth Wall saw the need specifically, right? So why are we here? We saw the need because there's a lot of confusion and MSPs are being targeted by their clients as the risk advisors around this, whether you're, you know, we're positioned that way or not. So these questions that are coming through the assessments, um, they're being directed towards you. So Fifth Wall took the initiative. We started working strategically with MSPs to help guide and build a process around that, right? Where you have now a framework that clients are being beholden to. Um, and that framework can be uh, actually a good opportunity for a lot of MSPs that are, the insurance is finally pushing the right things that they want to see in a risk. Um, and they're being more methodical about it. Well, anything you would add there? Just kind of uh, skipping through no, some I think, large chunks. I think you you shared the entire story of cyber insurance. How did we get here? I don't know if people want yeah. an entire any more history from Will Brooks because it's usually flawed. <laughs> well, it's 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 there's there's a lot of nuances. I think because there's it, I don't know where folks are coming from as far as maybe some already existing pain you probably experienced during that. As I overgeneralize that that four year period that we went through. Um, but there was a lot of shifts and there have been significant shifts, but what brings us today is that that was a tumultuous period that I think it could have been avoided, but it wasn't, but here we are. And I think we're finally in a far more stable position. We far, but we, we better understand what carriers are looking for. We better understand, um, what it is that we're trying to do to, um, I'm not going to say get an ROI because we're not there yet, but for both you as an MSP and your clients that are making investments to better your security posture and reduce your risk, carriers are getting better at seeing that. They're getting better at understanding that and they're getting better at recognizing that, um, hopefully in the premium that you're paying uh, or maybe the discount that you see. 
you, you did say, I mean, maybe one thing to, to keep in mind for people listening in most ways, cyber insurance really is still a baby compared to all these other lines of insurance that are out there. I mean, when you think commercial property, when you think li- liability in general, uh, general liability, um, when you think about those those types of coverages, they've been around for, for a really long time. Uh, and the agents who typically work on these, I mean, they've been you know in business for 30 years. They really understand all these lines of coverage. And now comes along cyber coverage that they have to learn and carriers still quite aren't at the place where they understand what's going on either. So, um, I mean, I know, Connor, we're going to get to a point where we talk about what's to come. But I think right now, a really important piece to point out is you as an MSP might be looking at these uh what a carrier might consider to be a good risk. And you're saying, well, yeah, those are, those are kind of the obvious things, but there's so much more that this client really should have. Right. And to Reed's point before, it's all based on past data. It's historic data. So until the data catches up, um, mm-hmm. the, the carriers aren't going to be requiring the right controls. And the challenge with cyber is we're talking about an industry now that is rapidly evolving. It's not stagnant. It's not like I, I said yesterday, Reed, in, in a different conversation, um, homes, cars, in a lot of ways, They've gotten safer, right? But cyber, the challenge is going to be there's always going to be new threats that emerge. And because new threats emerge, new security measures are going to have to come about. So it's going to be this back and forth, I think, for a, a long time. It's going to stabilize at points, but I think it's going to be this consistent reevaluation of what what's considered a threat. Yep. Yeah. I, go, um, go ahead. Go ahead, Reed. I was just going to say, fire has not changed, right? We, we know what it does. We know what what it burns, what it does not burn, things like that, right? Cyber, we wish it was that simple, but it's it's not going to stay static as far as what does it do and how does it do it. Well, that's always going to change. One thing I've always found helpful when discussing cyber insurance, at least for my understanding, is can you two name who? What are all the players in the space? Not like the names of the underwriters, but like from the nebulous group of people that sit in an office and decide that they're going to offer cyber right. insurance to the person who ends up signing on the, signing the policy because they need the coverage who are all the different people and what are those those names that they'll end up inter- interfacing yeah. with so i mean you're speaking to kind of like what's the ecosystem behind the curtain right so like who are the yeah. players and and where do they sit so um where do i want to start at the top at the bottom let's start at the top Okay. And this, this probably is not something that you would encounter working with an agent, but so um, first, let me preface that insurance is more or less organized gambling folks. That's what it is. Right. So they're trying to place the right bets. Right. Yeah. And, and they are in an industry where they get to choose. Right. But um, you have to have money to back up what you're insuring. Right. And there's a reinsurance world up there. So yes, there's an insurance for the insurers. And that's called reinsurance. And reinsurance, in another word, is capacity, right? So it sits up at the very top, and it's saying, how much capacity do we have to write all the business that fits down at the bottom? And how much money do we collect? Did we raise it in the beginning? And did we collect it during, you know, while we're, while we're writing policies? That's in partnership with an insurer, carrier, let's use that word. A carrier, like you've heard the names Hartford, Travelers, Chubb, right? Some of these also are their own reinsurers. So that's where it gets kind of more complicated, but let's keep them, them separated for now. So to get to those, those those carriers have products that are insurance policies. They want to get these policies down to the consumer. Um, traditionally, it has always been the carrier is going to appoint an agent to access the product. Um, but with cyber, it's much it's it's called what's it's an excess and surplus lines, meaning it's it's not your typical rodeo right so majority of the market has to go through what's called a wholesaler and that's what we are as a wholesaler we actually work with all those markets and what they prefer is that we're that you know uh expert hub that then the agents go to and then we are making a determination and advising and helping go to which markets are appropriate right when i say market i'm sorry carriers which carriers are appropriate so from there you know the wholesaler is working with the agent who then is working with the end client right um you can have different version of that right we have some that go direct you have some agents that their agency is big enough that they can represent they can go to a lot of carriers direct but you have for for the most part a lot of small carriers that just or sorry small agencies that don't have that ability so if that's the ecosystem you were looking for connor 
as riveting as that might be. That's that's how it's set up. Yes. Uh, understanding right. where understanding the landscape is the first step to understanding where your place in the cyber insurance conversation is as an MSP. In my mind. Yeah. And, and if I can tie that back. So the pain I'm talking about, all these changes, whenever the reinsurance capacity goes low. So basically the big the big bank, let's just say in the sky. Right. That starts to run low. Questions start getting asked, especially if that that bank goes completely empty. So uh, that's kind of what happened with cyber for a couple of years, where all of a sudden capacity got super, super, super low. And that's not really happened in a while and in, in a single line of coverage for some time. Uh, and that's where we saw all the volatility. Got it. Got it. So Kurt here has a it looks like two questions. So let's get to the first one. Question on legal liability. We've been counseled by our legal counsel, who is MSP and tech specific, to not recommend plans or limits or other things due to liability. What is your take on that? Reed, so you take that one. I have an opinion. Yeah. So my yeah. Opi- I, my personal opinion on this, okay, is that um, as an MSP, your clients, uh, they are your they are, they are your exposure as well. They represent what from an ENO perspective. So let's, let's start with that. As an MSP, the type of coverage you should have, you should protect yourself against a cyber event, but you should also have protection for your potential errors and omissions that your service provides or lack thereof. That's called a tech ENO policy. So when you look at tech ENO and you're evaluating that risk, you look at your clients because they are part of your exposure and you want to say or ask the question, how high of risk are those clients to me? Now their risk goes down and therefore your risk goes down whenever they have transferred that risk onto an insurance policy, right? So the more, if this makes sense, the more policies that your clients have that have transferred that risk, it's actually less exposure to you as a business. So step one, I would say is as an MSP, it is in your best interest to understand your exposure at the client level. You're not making recommendations on a policy or anything like that, but you are asking, do you have proof of coverage? That's a start, right? So as a cyber uh, insurance risk advisor, that's what I would look at. Now the whole recommendations. So if you're saying, all right, you know what, right, read, you're right. What do I do about that? Um, do not recommend a limit, 100%. So from a legal perspective, do not put anywhere that as you are telling your client to carry a million in cyber liability. There are a lot of reasons why not to do that because what you don't want is your client to say, hey, I had a cyber event and it was like 3 million bucks and you said I only need to carry a million. And you're like, no, I didn't. I just said, I, but wait, and then boop, boop, pointing fingers. Um, you can say that you need them to require proof of coverage, okay? And what you're saying there is that you want them to show proof that they have cyber insurance. Um, what cyber insurance they have is not for you to vet. So obviously I'm biased. You could have someone like Fifth Wall represent as a third party and say, I'd like you to go through a process here. They're gonna do an analysis in your policy and see what it actually is and what it is not. Um, so that's my stance. And I think uh, from my point of view, requiring your 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 clients to carry cyber is a very general statement because there are a lot of different kinds of coverage there um i'm not going to go in down that rabbit hole um but as soon as you get into the limit conversation as soon as you get to any type of coverages that is a huge huge red flag like don't do that at all so that's my stance you can't even say well, you need at least is that even something that people should avoid? So you could, and I've seen it. That if you talk to like, you know, the, the, if you talk to like Eric Tilts, right? Who I, who I think you know, right? And and yeah. any uh, other folks that have really focused on the legal aspect for MSPs and the exposure is you want to reduce specific recommendations like that because you never know what they're going to come back. And this is, I mean, you MSPs have an ENO policy for the very reason of you may actually have provided an error omission of your service. But at the end of the day, all that really matters is that your client perceives that there was an error omission within your service. Now we have an open claim. Okay. So I look at that and I say, okay, well then perception's reality, right? So how do we want to look at the perception of what you're saying or communicating? Um, and unfortunately, in a very litigious society, you know, you're looking at it with with that type of magnifying glass. Can I put this out there though, too, on top of that? So saying something like at least, Connor, one of the issues in the cyber insurance landscape is there are a lot of really bad policies that have that 1 million number attached to them. So it feels like you're carrying a million in limits, but at the end of the day you are, but most of the things that you really would run the risk of getting covered for aren't covered on a policy. Right. And so 
it's it's that kind of thing where even if you say at least a million now they go oh you told me to get a million dollar policy i got this it didn't cover anything look at you right so your friends and all those issues like and i think that's why the recommendation and like we like to say you should require it on some level but it doesn't mean you have to make specific recommendations bring in someone who actually is licensed in insurance to have those conversations you know alongside you and that's that's really i think the the when it comes to the the specifics right yeah um, the other question on here, though, is is actually one we just talked about it this morning, Reed, because um, I mean, for anyone who's coming to IT Nation, we're actually doing a talk on that exact topic. So would be worth swinging by. But um, the, the question is, we've also been told in the case of a breach, if we start incident response, we may invalidate a client's insurance. Obviously, part of the process is notifying the insurance carrier, but we can't sit around and wait for ransomware to spread, waiting for decisions from insurance on what we can and can't do. We have best security practices to follow, and we're not subrogating security processes to an insurance company. True, right? So on the one hand, um, first of all, I don't know of any insurance, Reed, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know of any insurance company that's going to say, oh, no, let let everything spread. It's totally fine. We want to pay more out on our claim. Right. I don't, I don't think that's how an insurance company. So we always say isolate and containment is your number one goal in this. Like if you can isolate, contain, or even reject the, uh, or eject the bad actor, you're in a good spot. Right. Um, the challenge comes when, when you think of part of all the stuff that goes on with incident response. And I always like to paint this picture with clients. Um, a small business is not, not necessarily equipped with the legal knowledge or the, financial knowledge or anything to be able to deal with all of the liability ramifications of a cyber incident. So for example, credit monitoring, depending on what state you live in, there are laws requiring who's supposed to be notified, how fast they're supposed to be notified. Um, If X amount of people have their data lost, then you must notify everyone. There's all that kind of stuff. Like, I don't know those laws. And most people, I feel like, don't know those laws. The beauty of the insurance policy and one of the benefits is that an insurance carrier is going to bring in the people who handle those specific things so that the small business itself does not need to think about it because they're not going to think about it. Their thought process is my computer is unusable and Kurt, you're not fixing it. Why aren't you fixing it? Right. And that's, you just need to get me back up online. That's your job. That's why I hired you. Get me back up online. Meanwhile, there's all this other stuff that has to happen. And a lot of times clients aren't really thinking about it. So insurance is, is kind of tugging the reins a little bit because if you were to completely restore the incident, meaning from backups, wiping logs, all that kind of stuff un- unintentionally, right? You're not supposed to wipe logs. That's bad practice. But let's say you did. Um, now forensics comes in. They say, we can't determine anything. We don't know what the heck happened here. So now insurance is going to say, well, we can't pay this claim because we don't know what happened, right? And so it, it is a fine line to walk, but definitely, I mean, I wouldn't say just sit there and let it spread either. Go ahead, Reed. Yeah, I- I, here's the recommendation is, and I think we're going to talk about this more on a separate conversation, but when it comes to what it is that matters, your client has expectations of who you are and what you're going to do, but then you also have reservations of your role with another third party and that third party's insurance, because you know, the streams cross, right? Get on the same page with that third party. So step one, Hey client, can I have a copy of your policy? Why? Well, one, uh, I need to know your effective date because I typically get the renewal applications and I kind of need to know when that's coming. Um, and two, I need to understand your carrier's IR process. I'm going to reach out, call them. Um, and this is part of my job, right? I need to understand. And it, that phone call can be really simple. Hey, I'm an MSP. I also provide IR services. Maybe you don't, but you're just basically stating here are the things that I would like to do. I need to understand the rules of engagement here. Where's the police tape? Every carrier is different, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Sorry to say that, but just if you were to say, hey, this is a good idea. And it's like, well, if I do it with one, do I do it with all? No, unfortunately, you, you probably need to make sure you've had that individual conversation. But then within your IR plan, if you come back to your client and say, hey, look, I actually was able to have a really substantive conversation with your carrier, right? And uh, this is the plan. That's a really, really valuable conversation. That would tell me that you have done above and beyond. And you're preparing for reality, not the hypothetical, well, maybe I'll do this, maybe I'll do that, but I'm not really sure because what will the insurance carrier tell me to do or not do? Um, You don't have that ambiguity. So at the end of the day, uh, I really encourage MSPs to talk to the carriers, call that line that's on all, all policies in the event of a breach. You call that line and just say who you are and here's the information I would like to find out. 
Awesome. That is a good recommendation. We haven't even started talking about sublimits and carve outs and, and the ways that those Don't get can you started, baby. Interject them. So I'm <laughs> I'm I'm saying the right things for Reed right here. He's he's gonna be buying me a drink at IT Nation just so I'll start asking these questions and we can talk all night about Keep it them. going. Keep, Keep it, it going. going for sure. Um so we kind of talked about how we got here and here being where uh where cyber insurance is today. What is happening now in cyber insurance? Mm-hmm. So we're here now. What is now? All right. So um, Will and I will do a little back and forth on this. So um, what I typically describe is like we went on a roller coaster ride, but it wasn't a fun one, right? Everything that's described was, you know, we're building our way up. Insurance carriers are trying to figure out what they're doing and it's click, 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 click. We're working our way up, working our way up and we're ready for to go back down. Going back down would be like, well, hey, the premiums went up. The process got more complicated. They're asking more questions. But one page app was a seven page app. Now it's a 12 page app. Like does progress mean that we go slightly back to where things were? And that's not the case, right? Progress means that they've established a better baseline and we are now better understanding what's actually making a difference. So in insurance act, you know, we'll mention this earlier. It's an actuarial world. They look back to the past to make decisions about the future. They still don't have a lot of information about the past. Right. And by the way, that information seems to constantly be changing as far as relevancy, because we just talked about cyber is this always moving target. So it's tough. But what one of the observations we've made, and I talk to carriers very regularly, is what they're trying to find is that line of best fit, which is I need to be gathering enough information, right, to to adequately assign what level of risk I think this client is. But they're also still they're running a business. They're trying to scale. So like they could go full bore and say, look, we need to see, send us your policies and procedures too, because we're going to read those over. We need to see validation for these things, blah, blah, blah. Some of them you actually might expect because it's within reason, but others it's like, well, this is aggressive. I don't think it's ever going to go down that route because they're also trying to, they're trying to ride that line, right? And so I think we are finally to a point where they've gathered enough information to say, I think we're hedging our bets enough, right? Remember, organized gambling. Now, what does the future hold? Well, if I'm saying I, they're still hungry for more data and they're still hungry for better understanding the risk, right now, everything is being asked once a year on a piece of paper, right? And it is static, meaning, hey, Connor, I need to know what Finn's doing right now. And I'm going to write a policy for you for a whole year, all right? Wow. Now, Connor yes. has MFA across all of his users, but then he just hired 20 more people because his business has just taken off. Good for Connor. Good job. Way to go, Connor. Yeah. Connor forgot to put MFA on those new employees. Do I know that as an insurer? You should take security awareness training, Connor. I should. Come on, buddy. (laughs) Um, But 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 that's what that's what carriers are kind of now getting into because they're like, okay, we're asking the right questions. Good, good. But we're still experiencing higher losses because we're realizing that that question at that point in time may have been relevant, but then the the uh, the client's risk changes, right? So what we can expect for the future. Um, one. We are already seeing it right now. I just described a outside assessment, meaning, hey, who are you now? Fill this piece of paper. It's going to go more internal. It's going to go more towards real time validation. We're already seeing some companies pop up to say, hey, look, we need to be be able to get real time validation around MFA, for example. Right. Yeah. I I love that you indicated you have MFA on uh, all remote access. But on a weekly basis, we just need to see, you know, from a read only standpoint that that's in fact true. And if any of those Trump is false, we're just going to make sure that you rectify that, right? In a certain time frame, yeah. Yeah, very similar to the, you know, safe drive and safe. You plug a thing into your car. Now, gosh, that gets very big brothery feeling. Um, and so there's going to be different companies that are approaching this in different ways. You have some companies that are looking at this as a self-serving model for their one product, right? You have a, you have a carrier A. I'm not going to name names when I do this. The carrier A develops their safe drive and save little plugin. That plugin is going to go for themselves, for their own data, and hopefully they're making good decisions, but it's just serving the one carrier or one program. What I'm really excited about are those that are more agnostic. They're saying, we want to build a platform, and I'm, there's there are those that are building this out that are more for the masses. It is, look, as an MSP community, for example, Here's a program that can actually do real-time validation that carriers are going to want to see. Now, carriers 
are going to need to pay for that, right? So rather it be a money making engine for a carrier or uh, yeah, for a carrier, they should be investing into that. And from my perspective, when we see the future going this way, it's going to real time telemetry. Um, what we want to see that? is, yeah. Here's the challenge is insurance forever has been built on a good faith agreement. So there's pieces, Kurt brought it up in his Q and a about, and Reed, you just mentioned that the little, the little dongle that people install in their cars to yep. help with speed and that kind of thing. But for the most part, when you apply for insurance, it does not matter what line of insurance that exists out there. It is based on a good faith agreement. You are, you are saying that these, these things are the case and the carrier mm -hmm. saying, if these things are the case, we will cover you, right? That's how it's always been. So it's been built on that. The problem is because of the nature of cyber, it can't stay that way specifically for cyber. It has to shift. Um, and and to to Reed's issue, and I also think to Kurt's question, because I want to hit on this, is there's a difference between we have we know of a couple of carriers that have created, um, I'm not gonna uh, an agent of sorts where they're like, hey, just install this on your client's network, and then we'll be able to track that data in real time. It'd be great. MSPs look at that, they're like, oh, no way am I installing something on on Another on my agent. clients system especially yep. something you as an insurance agent who doesn't even understand good security or insurance carrier that you as that doesn't understand good security i'm not trusting your your client or your agent or whatever we're going to call it right so there's that and to read to your point i mean there's 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 multiple ways to approach this and having something that's not specific to one carrier that also doesn't involve some sort of installation on every client's machine right right but approaches the data in a different way is really vital and it's moving in that direction and i think the adoption is going to be on the carrier side and that's where it's going to be slow so all of us on the call and all of you on the webinar you're looking at it like oh logically this makes sense why don't they have some sort of api where they just pull it in it just makes perfect sense carriers just do this and since their whole business practice is built on that good faith thing i think there's going to be slow adoption but they're going oh. to have to get there yeah I and i think go ahead connor Please. I remember having many conversations with you all about there's going to be somebody who the underwriter works with MSPs to tell them which tools they have relationships with to feed this data back into uh, policies that they've written into end clients. It's like if the underwriter, the MSP and the vendors, the MSP decides to use uh, aren't all in agreement that the data needs to go back to the underwriter for this. And I think I've learned it from you, continuous underwriting. I don't know who coined that mm -hmm. phrase. I don't even know if it's trademarked and I'm allowed to say it here, but it's like, uh, if the threats we face today are not the threats, threats we faced yesterday, why are we still writing policy? Why are we still beholden to a policy that was written with data that existed two years ago? And to your point, Reed, not even all that data that they had two years ago is accurate. It's like, we're still finding right. out stuff that happened two yeah. years ago, uh, that exists today. Um, <laughs> and what happened initially that you had mentioned is, all right, great. We'll just double, triple, quadruple the policy, uh, the um, the amount that they're going to have to pay for the policy. It's like, all right, well, now I can't afford this. So it's like, how do we exactly. actually, how do you, exactly? how do you write policies that are, the value you're getting is commensurate with the risk that the, the underwriter is actually assuming. And that's, that's where I want MSPs to like, we'll hit the nail on the head. Like if they, if they want to install an agent, no, that's a yeah. security nightmare. Like, please don't. I mean, if you're requiring that, that's silly. Um, there are other ways, like the technology already exists, like the lightweight SIM, for example, like via APIs. We're already seeing that, read-only access, things that um, provide the data without having to actually install something onto the network. But what I want MSPs to know is like, it feels big brothery. There's no way around it. But at the end of the day, what we're trying to prove out that you, they are low risks and it's not just the presence of what it's not just the presence of the control it's how are they managed right that's at the end of the day or how are we getting is this managed properly and we should want to be transparent about that to a degree right so if we're doing this the right way um there was a question here on um i'm going to scroll back up real quick um on the matthew yeah Jay's i'm wondering if carriers are trying to provide MSSP services because they see revenue potential to supplement policy revenue. So, yep, like I'll be blunt. There are carriers out there right now that they may have originally set out to do this as a risk reduction method. Like let's provide our clients access to the tools that we're gonna be asking them to, to use anyway uh, to reduce that risk. But inherently it's like, wait, we can make money off of this. So. I've already seen it. I've already seen, you know, they're making 
strong recommendations on preferred tools, um, well, which it, is not right. It goes even further than that. And yeah. there's something that I say for MSPs, here's where your leverage exists, though, because you have a carrier who's saying, hey, we've partnered with so-and-so global MSP to provide your security. And if you if you get a policy with us, they'll provide you the security. So now the incentive is you get a policy with carrier A, and by doing so, you're agreeing to get security controls through this partner of carrier A. And here lies the problem. Now the, the client has lost all autonomy on selecting a cyber policy. Yeah. So they're now stuck with carrier A's pricing. Whereas you as an MSP, you're saying, hey, I'm not binding you to a carrier. I'm going to do everything I can to ensure, ensure with an E that you're a good risk to the carrier market. And then the carriers across the board are going to be able to take their, you know, give you their policy options um, by and so the carrier approach yeah maybe they're seeing revenue from it but in terms of business strategy it's really locking clients into one option and as soon as they no longer go with that carrier now they lose their msp services um, and that's yeah. that's an issue it's like uh yeah. what I... who, if the fox is in the in house uh, who who's who's auditing the auditors is a question that exactly. i've heard about cybersecurity. so if you're if the person who has also underwritten your policy is the person providing the services to make sure you're compliant with the policy, you lose both if you want to get rid of one. Yep. Yep. And I think there's, there is a, uh, a reality that I think a lot of this is going to fail in terms of like, I call it drive behind the snowplow. The first people are going to do this, they're bearing the brunt, right? And they're going to do things right or wrong. We know this is the direction this is headed. Like I'm just seeing too many, too too many moves in the marketplace to say, maybe this is a blip. It's no, probably a year and a half from now, it's going to be the norm, maybe two years. Um, but there's going to be folks that are going to do it the right way and the wrong way. And I honestly think the acknowledgement of what MSPs represent in the SME industry, like as a whole, right? So when you look at who are the risk advisors in the enterprise space, oh, well, we're talking to IT. Well, if you're talking to the SMB side, it's like the majority is serviced by MSPs. All right, well, then you better have a tool or a process that it's accommodating to those risk advisors. Um, and it has to work with them, not against them. And that's why I was speaking to you have those that are agnostic and they're trying to build platforms that um, are good. Like at the end of the day, they're not beholden to the regulation or rules of a specific carrier who's calling the shots saying, hey, I want to do it this way. And I want to promote this, this solution or this vendor because we've got a contract behind the scenes and I can make more money. Um, no, 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 no. We want to look for those that are staying agnostic, staying neutral. Um, they're bringing the data to the carriers and they're saying, hey, carriers, you got to pony up because this is the data you're looking for. And it's coming from a community that is servicing the majority of the SMB space. Um, so we can go into more detail on that, Connor, but I think just generally speaking, I think the question was, what do I see in the future? Well, that's what's happening. And I think there's a lot that has to evolve of yeah. what this is going to look like specifically. But I, for those that are listening, it's just keep your eyes and ears out because it's coming. I've always thought about it from a, um, I, I want to use the word ontological here, but I don't want to sound uh, weird. It's like, what are what are the underwriters incentivized to do? It's take better risk, make more money. That's how they make more money is they take better risk. How are they going to take better risk? Getting more accurate data. How do they get more accurate data? Real-time updates from the people that they've written policies to. Yep. Okay. Well, if the cyber insurance industry is incentivized to make more money, which no business exists to run on profit All right. for long, it's like, that's going to have to happen. It's, there's going to have to be access to better data, and it's not going to be through the MSPs. It's going to be through the tools that they decide to deploy. Maybe it's yep. the MSP rolling it up and giving them access in some capacity, but I don't even see that being centralized enough for cyber insurance underwriters to care. It's like- yep. Well, unless I have access to all of it, I no, it, it doesn't it, matter. There has to be a trusted aggregator to a degree. When yes. I say trusted, I mean based on the process that that data is collected yeah. and what's being shown. Um, because I agree, like there's just too much fox in the hen house yep. for a lot of this. And to that earlier question, I mean, I we saw this about a year and a half ago. It was, I think certain carriers are going to start to be competitors to the MSP space because they want to try to drive security solutions. And it is very, very just out of uh, left field for, you know, an insurance agent to be like, oh yeah, so let's start talking though about, you know, your, your actual security. Cause I want to say like, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm not going to buy 
my security solutions from an insurance agent, but yeah. they're still testing those waters. They're still trying to see what floats. Yeah. Some of us barely want to buy drinks from them to begin with. To, <laughs> to talk to them. Yeah. Right. So um, I think Patrick's question here actually leads us right into our next topic really cleanly is cyber insurance going to standardize. Uh, it looks like standardized questionnaires and policies like PCI did for payment cards. It, what does standardization for the MSPs look like? So are we saying, do we feel like it's like a framework almost and a level of compliance is how much of an influence is insurance going to have, right? From a security standpoint. Well, I'm thinking, Reed, standpoint. I'm thinking the questions asking more. Is there a poverty start, line? Are you going to start to see right? like a unanimous application, uh, not unanimous, a, a similar sure. application across all the all the different carriers where the requirements are all the same at least on a basic level um that there'll be a you know a singular base where it's like as long as you do these things so let's say it was i mean cis gets thrown around a lot right in this space so let's say hey you reach um ig1 ig1 and you're a you're a good risk now to all the carriers great job um my thing is i don't think until <laughs> golf clap i don't think yeah. we're going to be at a spot um, where carriers are kind of consistent across the board until some sort of regulatory step in the cyber insurance space exists. Uh, it's going to either be, because right now the answer is no, I don't see a standardization in the future. But what I do say see is that a lot can happen out of chaos and crisis. So, you know, insurance is petrified of a systemic event in the MSP space specifically. Right. They already saw it a little bit with the Buffalo jumping with like the say event, for example. Um, what the scuttlebutt, I'll say, has been has been around like, all right, hurricane season dictates a lot for the insurance industry. Right. Because there's catastrophic loss and they can make good determinations and judgments based off of kind of like, well, if worst case scenario looks like this. Right. It's a good benchmark to have. They are absolutely clueless on worse, what worst case scenario actually looks like for cyber because there's never been a catastrophic event. People so, think there has been. Yeah. There has never the been. data one. doesn't exist. Yep. Not even like the solar winds? You wouldn't even consider that a catastrophic nope. event? Not even close. Not even So the, the crazy thing is like solar winds, um, like there's like kind of the top three. Kaseya was one too, but like yeah. what you would have assumed on the back end was not in fact the case. Like there were not a lot of claims filed. There weren't. So like we saw a lot of activity, but a lot of those folks probably didn't even have insurance too. Like we just didn't see the claims. So like from the insurance perspective, activity is one thing, but claims data is another. And there just has not been claims data to support a catastrophic event. Got it. Do you, think that you kind of mentioned a reason that might be is that there weren't enough actually insured people when the solar winds breach happened. When was that in 2018, 2019? Yep. Something like that. Um, Oh, like pre-pandemic that. that's how i determine time now <laughs> that is also how i measure <laughs> um the, the, it, do you think that's a reason is it then there weren't claims just because there were people to even have a claim because they didn't have the policies it's possible i mean pre-pandemic adoption rate of cyber was very low um yeah. it was still happening but it was again it was it was even more of a baby than it is now so people weren't really adopting it quickly and anyone who was it was like these cheap kind of add-on policies That's or it. simple policies or things like that. So they weren't going out and buying comprehensive policies that ultimately would cover them for anything in the first place. So that might be part of it for sure. To to touch on um, Matt's question here, uh, the subject, that, uh, one of the subjects we had talked about earlier, and I think Will was the one that mentioned it, is, you know, houses have gotten safer and general liability is always general liability, but the cybersecurity risk you assume today is not the cybersecurity risk you assume tomorrow. So how can an industry who's used to not only brand new in insurance, but how can an industry that's working with data that's two years old when literally day by day, it's like tomorrow, something could occur. It's, yeah. it's not a three-day weekend, so probably not, uh, but there could be a hack tomorrow that's like, all well, right, uh, the landscape has completely changed now. We need to worry about some other thing, new a thing. good example of this was a couple years about a year ago there was a medical portal where people could log in and they could check out their you know uh prescription data and like their different prescriptions and things like that so they knew what to get um timing all that kind of stuff and then what they started to notice was 
they would be on Facebook or Instagram and they'd start getting advertisements for their prescription medication. And what happened is that this, whoever created this portal, they had not followed proper uh, cookie tracking, metapixel tracking, and uh, turning it off really in this case, because that stuff shouldn't have shown up in the first place. And literally like overnight carriers started adding all of these clauses and exclusions into policies concerning metapixel and stuff like that. So, um, it's very knee jerk. And so when something big like that does happen, where carriers are like, Oh, we weren't thinking about this. We should add, you know, specific language to this. It does happen um, pretty quickly. But the challenge is that even if you were to have carriers kind of adhering to a best practice kind of scenario, because to your point, Connor, things are changing like overnight. Sometimes uh, you don't know what's going to happen. It's not just going to be, huh? Yeah. My car now has the ability to, um, Tur- turn right. itself on you know it's not it's not stuff like that it's it's gonna it, it's a new threat that emerges or a new potential gap right. or hole that they're now saying oh we didn't we never patched this we need to fix this and it's just well it, it's also not something you can plan for because it's like well yeah. you know autonomous vehicles are new but we also like knew it was coming as they were being developed right it's not like i don't know if you guys knew this but my car all of a sudden it has a new button and it, it can fly now it's like out of nowhere Reed, weren't That's you just telling like, us a story about your car having a button you never pressed and it did something really this cool? This is now? actually very true. There's a button oh. I found in my car I did not know existed. And when I pressed it, the screen moved up and a secret compartment opened up and I lost my mind. But that's for another time. Um, <laughs> Cyber. What we're talking about here <laughs> is um, we don't have, uh, it's not very predictable. And so we get to, back to the last statement, real-time telemetry is going to be very helpful. I don't, I just don't see a future where it's not knee jerk to it to a degree. I think it's just the nature of the beast. I could be wrong, but I Let think me put it this way. You can't predict what's going to happen tomorrow in the cyber industry. Right. And then if carriers are basing what they're doing off of at least one year of underwriting data, then something that happens tomorrow, unless it's something crazy like this metapixel incident, you're probably not going to get enough data on the measure of how to best protect from that until another year goes by so because they need a whole cycle of saying oh we're going to start asking about this control on applications okay now we've got enough data to show that having that control actually helps compared to people who didn't and things like that right so it's just it does take a while and that's where um it's going to have to it's going to something's going to give i just don't know it's not going to i don't think it's going to be like a consistent line of it's all mellowed out now everything's easy and predictable it's just that's not the state of the industry i mean as an msp you know your work is anything but predictable. You get a phone call in five minutes from a client saying, I have a, a pop-up on my screen that can't go away. Can you reset it? And it's a ransomware attack, right? And it's like, it, it, it can happen, so. Yep. I mean, I always, it's, there's really little innovation in homes, the auto industry, liability elsewhere. There is daily innovation in cybersecurity mm-hmm. and technology. It's like, as much as you innovate is also as much new risk as you create largely. Uh, and uh, to bring this back to something MSPs probably understand, Log4j and Print Nightmare happened this year and last year. Did any cyber insurance carrier understand that when they wrote you a policy in the last 10 months? Probably not. It's probably not even nope. mentioned or even understood in any of the policies that you took a look at. But- they ask about Log4j on their applications but I am willing to guess that 95% of underwriters just see it as a yes or no. And if anyone puts, no, I have not patched for log for any log for J, then they're like, oh, okay, denied policy. I don't know what this means, but we're not giving them a policy. Ask them what log for J is. And like, <laughs> uh, I don't know. It looks like a weird name for something. Isn't that, that something a new musician, you... right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so new... Isn't that a well, mathematical the... equation? That the kids are listening to, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's the, the uh, kids yeah. are listening to. Yeah. Kurt, Kurt has a good question down here. Um, does it make sense to partner with a broker? We were approached by TechRug. Now we have an M- now that they have an MSP partner program, or should we just stay out of partnerships directly? What's your y'all's take on that? I do think MSP should align. Like, let me actually take a step back. If you agree with the approach to a couple things, one, understanding your clients' level of risk, which means understanding do they have cyber insurance and what does that insurance look like. Uh, if you think that's a good thing, yes, get aligned with a broker because you want a licensed person to do that. Obviously, that's not for you. Two, if you think that understanding what cyber insurance is looking for and it's conducive to your sales efforts, 
because what a lot of what insurance is requiring now is a lot of the things that you're selling. Yes. But guess what? Again, bring a broker in. It's a licensed conversation, right? And it, it here's the recommendation is at least on the fifth wall side, because that's that's exactly what we do. We align ourselves around an education path first, meaning like if we're going to, if an MSP says, comes to us and say, hey, fifth wall, we want a partner. Um, we can, great. Um, let's start talking to your clients. Well, it's an education first. Let's talk to your client to help them understand what do they have and what do they understand about what they have before we go start pitching a solution. We can do a gap analysis, help them all to understand all that. And that exercise is actually really helpful to get the information the MSP should have, right? From an IR standpoint, understanding your exposure, all that. And also it kind of in its own organic way provides a gap analysis of what is insurance looking for and what does that client have? And guess what? Insurance gets to be the bad cop in that conversation. So yes, from my perspective, I'm very biased. I do recommend it. Um, Obviously, it's not a necessity to your business, but if this is part of how you want to drive your services and you think it's part of the value you want to bring to your end clients, it's a really, really good thing to do. Can I just add to that? Um, one of the biggest challenges you will find, though, and a lot of MSPs I've talked to, they are part of, you know, they'll, they'll be part of referral groups or things like that, where you have the one mortgage person and you have the 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 one insurance person and you have you know your different clicks. Most of the, and I was part of one of those groups back in my financial advisor days. And most of the time that insurance person is not cyber minded. And that is one of the biggest challenges. We just spent Good almost point. an hour talking about how this industry never stays the same and it requires consistent keeping up to date. So one of the questions I always pose to MSPs, when you are going to, you know, look, look for a broker relationship. If you're if you're looking at the local agent level because you you like your local relationships, ask in that agency, hey, do you have a person on staff who is wholly dedicated to cyber? Because that's really how much is needed when it comes to uh, really being able to get a handle on it. And to Reed's point, fifth wall on our side, we have all this educational stuff. I know there was a question asked in the chat about revenue and different things. A large portion of what we do is coming in and having conversations and educating and teaching and doing stuff like this, which a standard insurance broker just does not have the time for because they're writing seven or eight lines of coverage unless there's one person on staff who is wholly dedicated to cyber because then they can focus on that educational piece because there are so many coverage line items that are so important. So make sure you ask that question because you want to, to the question we talked about earlier of like, how much should we recommend? What coverages should we recommend? You really can't, right? But do you you want to you want to vet an agent and make sure they know what they're talking about and not just willy nilly writing policies either. I um it's a good point. Mm -hmm. The advice that my lawyer gave me is probably fitting advice here for MSPs. My lawyer said I can help you with anything except if you give legal advice or tax advice. He's like, don't ever do that in any scenario. I was like, oh, oh okay. <laughs> it's like as an MSP, it's like, what should you do? It's like I I don't know, but the answer is to not give insurance advice because you're not an insurance agent. So yeah. uh he and, actually and you don't want that liability and you can transfer, you can get all that benefit and transfer that liability over to that agent. Have yeah, them, I, if they screw up, it's on their, you know, it's not on yeah. yours. But, but I think one of the reasons it's most important as an MSP to make sure you have a cyber minded partner if, um, is because for you, cyber insurance is a big piece of what funds the IR for your client. So if we live in this assumed breach world where something is going to happen, Right. When a client who is a small business owner who can't afford to stay afloat, if they have to fund uh, if they have to fund forensics and they have to fund a legal team to come in and handle everything and their own PR and their own and then their business is down for two weeks, they're not going to survive. And for you, both from a business sense, hey, if this if this client goes through a, an incident without a policy, they're not a client anymore. But also from the other side of it of saying, hey, my work as an MSP extends past just protecting them with a bunch of security controls. The incident response piece is all a big piece of what MSPs are doing now. So if if cyber insurance has become a crucial piece of incident response, it really is imperative that you bring someone in who understands it and aren't just picking a willy nilly agent out of the blue. Awesome. Um, for the folks that have been listening this whole time, where where would you like them to find more information on either y'all or where would you like them to connect with you too? Uh, if you want to learn more about Fifth Wall, go to Fifth Wall Solutions, fifthwallsolutions.com slash MSP. Don't go to fifthwall.com because that is a financial advising firm. And I've had a couple of emails come through 
like months later where someone will say, I tried emailing you guys like half a year ago. No one ever got back to me. And it's because they went to fifthwall.com. Don't go to fifthwall.com, fifthwallsolutions.com slash MSP. Um, and you can learn all a, a bunch about that there. Um, that's probably the best place to look for us and to, to learn more about our partnership program and all the good stuff. If you're going to be at IT Nation uh, in November, we're going to have a booth there and would love to connect with you all there. And then, yeah, LinkedIn as well. Um, oh, Jamie sent that to us. Yeah, my uh, I'll put my LinkedIn in the chat here. LinkedIn.com slash Wilbo, but the L is a one. So don't mess that one up either because I'm, I'm a gamer and fancy. I remember going through this when I <laughs> talked to you on the podcast. Like, I have no idea what that's going to turn into, but we'll have a link in the show notes. It's a lot easier on Zoom. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> to everyone here as well, just a reminder, you will be getting an e-guide on a guide to cyber insurance for MSPs crafted lovingly by our friends here at Fifth Wall Solutions. Um, one last thing as well, we have another webinar in our DCD series, October 24, 3 p.m., where we're going to talk about how cybersecurity is different for managed IT. Matthew J., you put in the chat at some point, uh, you know, MSPs made a transition from break fix to managed services, and now we're making that next transition from managed services to cybersecurity. So what's actually the difference? Uh, well, we're going to talk about it with our friends, Kyle Christensen and Wes Spencer. Any closing awesome. remarks from either Will or you, Reed? I'm just happy to be here, man. No, awesome. seriously. Uh, thank, thanks, everyone. I know it's cyber insurance. You never know what to expect if you're walking in a room with someone talking about cyber insurance. So I hope this was helpful and uh, worth here. If you have any questions, concerns, interest around this conversation, please reach out. Awesome. Ditto. Awesome. Will, Reed, thanks for joining me today. Cyber insurance is something I know incredibly small yeah. amounts about, but uh, always happy to chat with you about it. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you, everyone. All righty. See you soon.